Hi, Bobcats. I'm Mrs. Hertz. I'm a third grade teacher at Woodland, and today I have the pleasure of introducing our second ever Woodland Reads Read Aloud. We are going to start reading the book One Crazy Summer, written by Rita Williams Garcia. It's won several, several awards. It's worth seven AR points. It's about three young girls who are going to travel to California to find their mother. It's set in 1968, and I think you're going to see a lot of differences between our country today versus our country in 1968. We'll start with chapter one today. It's called Cassius Clay Clouds. Good thing the plane had seatbelts, and we'd been strapped in tight before takeoff. Without them, that last jolt would have been enough to throw Veneta into orbit and Fern across the aisle. Still, I anchored myself and my sisters best as I could to brace us for whatever came next. Those clouds weren't through with us yet and dealt another Cassius Clay left and a right jab to the bod body of our Boeing 727. Veneta shrieked, then stuck her thumb in her mouth. Fern bit down on Miss Patty's cake's pink plastic arm. I kept my whimper to myself. It was bad enough my inside squeezed in and stretched out like a monkey grinder's accordion. No need to let anyone know how frightened I was. I took a breath. So when my mouth finally opened, I'd sound like myself and not like some scared rabbit. It's just the clouds bumping. I told my sisters, like they bumped over Detroit and Chicago and Denver. Vanetta pulled her thumb out of her mouth and put her head in my lap. Fern held on to Miss Patty Cake. They listened to me. We push our way up in the clouds. The clouds get mad and push back, like you and Fern fighting over red and gold crayons. I didn't know about clouds fighting and pushing for a fact, but I had to tell my sisters something. As long as Vanetta kept her fear to one shriek and Fern kept hers to biting Miss Patty Cake, I kept on spinning straw, making everything all right. By the way, clouds don't push back. That's mainly what I do. Keep Vanetta and Fern in line. The last thing Pa and Big Ma wanted to hear was how we made a grand Negro spectacle of ourselves 30,000 feet up in the air around all these white people. You know how Papa is, I told him. No way he'd put us on a plane if it were dangerous. They halfway believed me. Just as I had that soft plastic arm out of Fern's mouth, those Cassius Clay fighting clouds threw our 727 another jab. Big Ma, that's Pa's mother. She still says Cassius Clay. Pa says Muhammad Ali, or just Ali. I slide back and forth from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali, whatever picture comes to mind. With Cassius Clay, you hear the clash of fists, like the plane getting jabbed and punched. With Muhammad Ali, you see a mighty mountain, greater than Everest, and can't no one knock down a mountain. All the way to the airport, Pa had tried to act like he was dropping off three sacks of wash at the laundromat. I'd seen through Pa. He's no Veneta putting on performances. He has only one or two faces, nothing hidden, nothing exaggerated. Even though it had been his idea that we fly out to Oakland to see Cecile, Pod never once said how exciting our trip would be. He just said that seeing Cecile was something whose time had come, that it had to be done. Just because he decided it was time for us to see her didn't mean he wanted us to go. My sisters and I had stayed up practically all night, California dreaming about what seemed like the other side of the world. We saw ourselves riding wild waves on surfboards, picking oranges and apples off of fruit trees, filling our autograph books with signatures from movie stars that we would see in soda shops. Even better, we saw ourselves going to Disneyland. We had watched airplanes lift, off, lift up and fly off into the blue sky as we neared the airport. Every time another airliner flew overhead, leaving a trail of white and gray smoke, Big Ma fanned herself and asked, Jesus, why? Big Ma had kept quiet long enough. Once inside the terminal, she let it all hang out. She told Pa, I don't mind saying it, but this isn't right. Coming out to Idlewood and putting these girls on a plane so Cecile can see what she left behind. 
If she wants to see, let her get on an airplane and fly out to New York. Big Ma doesn't care if President Kennedy's face is on the half dollar or if the airport is now officially named after him. She calls the airport by its old name, Idlewild. Don't get me wrong. Big Ma was as mad and sad as anyone when they killed the president. It's change she has no pity on. However, things are stamped in Big Ma's mind as how they will be now and forever. Idlewild will never be JFK. Cassius Clay will never be Muhammad Ali. Cecile will never be anything other than Cecile. Can't say I blamed Big Ma for feeling the way she did. I certainly didn't forgive Cecile. When Cecile left, Fern wasn't on the bottle. Vanetta could walk but wanted to be picked up. I was four going on five. Pa wasn't sick, but he wasn't doing well either. That was when Big Ma came up from Alabama to see about us. Even though Big Ma read her scripture daily, she hadn't considered forgiveness where Cecile was concerned. Cecile wasn't what the Bible meant when it spoke of love and forgiveness. Only judgment, and believe me, Big Ma had plenty of judgment for Cecile. So, even if Cecile showed up on Papa's welcome mat, Big Ma wouldn't swing the front door open. That was why Pa had put us on a plane to Oakland. Either Cecile wouldn't come back to Brooklyn, or she wasn't welcome. Honestly, I don't think Pa could choose between Big Ma and Cecile, even after Cecile left him, and us, even after Cecile proved Big Ma right. How can you send them to Oakland? Oakland's nothing but a boiling pot of trouble cooking. All them riots? Pa had a respectful way of ignoring Big Ma. I wanted to smile. He's good at it. A shrill voice had announced the departing flight to Oakland. All three of us had butterflies. Our first airplane ride, way up above Brooklyn, above New York, above the world. Although I could at least keep still, Vanetta and Fern stamped their feet like holy rollers at a revival meeting. Big Ma had grabbed them by the, fi- b- had grabbed them by the first scruff of fabric she could get a hold of, bent down and told them to act right. There weren't too many of us in the waiting area, and too many of them were staring. I'd taken a quick count out of habit. Vanetta, Fern, and I were the only Negro children. There were two soldier boys in green uniforms who didn't look any older than Uncle Darnell, high school cap and gown one day, army boots and basic training four days later. Two teenage girls with afros, maybe they were college students, and one lady dressed like Jackie Kennedy, carrying a small oval suitcase. Big Ma had also scouted around the waiting room. I knew she worried that we'd be mistreated in some way and sought out a grown brown face to look out for us. Big Ma turned her nose up at the college girls with afros in favor of the Negro lady in the square sunglasses and snappy suit toting the equally snappy oval bag. Big Ma made eye contact with her. When we lined up, she told the Negro Jackie Kennedy, These are my grandbabies. You look out for them, you hear? The snappy Negro lady had been nice enough to smile, but hadn't returned the look that Big Ma expected. And Big Ma had expected the look that Negro people silently pass each other. She had expected this stranger to say, as if she were a neighbor, They're as good as my own. I'll make sure they don't misbehave or be an embarrassment to the Negro race. A blank movie star smile had been all she passed to Big Ma. That lady had only been looking out for her plane seat. Papa had already given me a paper with the phone number to our house, which I knew by heart, and the phone number to his job. He had already told me that his job number was for emergencies only, and not for how you doing chats. Last night, he had also given me an envelope with $200 in $10 and $20 bills to put in my suitcase. Instead, I folded the bills and stuffed them in my tennis shoes before we left Herkimer Herkimer Street. Walking on that mound of money felt weird at first, but at least I knew the money was safe. Papa had kissed Vanetta and Fern and told me to look after my sisters. Even though looking after them would have been nothing new, I kissed him and I said, I will, Papa. When the line to the ticket taker had begun to move, Big Ma had gotten teary and mushed us up in her loose-fitting violet and green moo-moo dress. Better come on and get some lovin' now, 
she hadn't had to finish the rest about how this might be the last time in a long while for kissing and hugging. A flash of memory told me Cecile wasn't one for kissing and hugging. I had a lot of those memories clicking before me, like projector slides in the dark. Lots of pictures, smells, and sounds flashing in and out, mostly about Cecile, all going way, way back. And what I didn't remember clearly, Uncle Darnell always filled in. At least Uncle Darnell remembers Cecile kindly. And that's the end of chapter one. We can start making some predictions. How do you think uh, their landing in, in California is going to go? And Do you think Cecile is going to be happy to see them? <laughs>